You know, I'm so happy that you're here, friends, family, guests. Uh, it's the greatest day in history, honestly, this day where we get to celebrate Jesus Christ and his resurrection uh, from that grave. And you know, I have one thing to say again. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Today we have a theme of this message that you're going to hear over and over. And today that theme is look up. Look up. Seriously, look up right now. Yeah, a little too far. I'm talking about just right here. <laughs> no, uh, if you were here two nights ago, Good Friday, right? Uh, we had a black cloth that adorned the cross. And that, that black cloth, it, it symbolized death. It, it symbolized the hope that, that was lost, right? That the disciples thought were lost, the burden of sin upon Jesus. And then today we see it white uh, for the, the holiness of God, the, the life that comes through Jesus Christ, and just everything that he's done for us. We see the lilies, the palms, all, again, representing life. So praise God uh, for everything that he's done for us. Again, back to that theme of look up. I know that, uh, anybody watch Netflix in here? Show of hands? Yeah, there was a, a very popular movie out uh, last year. It was called Don't Look Up, right, by Meryl Streep. Well, I'm here today to say that Meryl's wrong, okay? And I know that's fighting words for some of you because you love Meryl, but Meryl's wrong. Today we're looking up, amen? amen? You see, that's what it's all about. And before I get into it, though, if we have any kids in here or youth that didn't go over to kids' church, I just want to say how happy we are that you're here today, that you're praising God with us, that you're hearing God's message here today as well in his words of forgiveness. You know, today we're all hyped up on the love of Jesus, and so uh, we are, I want to have a little game today, is that okay? The game is, I want you to count up all the different times that I say the word up, okay? So far it's been eight times, so start with eight, and we're going to count from here on. Are you ready? All right, some competitive adults in here, I know you're like, yes, a game on Easter, right? I'm going to keep my attention. I hope it, I hope it does. But you see... <laughs> Up is one of the craziest words in the English dictionary. In fact, if you ever tried to, to look up the word up in the dictionary, you'd see that it has about 30 different definitions. And it takes up about a quarter of a page. So I bet if you tried to build up all uh, a list of the ways that you could use the word up, if you didn't give up, right, you may wind up with 100 more. And then there's things like we fill up our gas tanks. And I know that's only getting more expensive. I know you can brighten up a room if you walk into it. We line up for tickets. Kids just want to stay up late. We open up a store in the morning. We close it up at night. We dress up. But to dress up with makeup, that's a special night, right? Speaking of makeup, we need to make up a story if we wake up late to get a makeup test at school. And I could go on and on, but some of you are like, when are we going to wrap up, right? <laughs> Doesn't he know I need to check up on my hand before my family shows up, right? But before any of that, I want to thank you for showing up this day because today is the day that we get to lift up the name of Jesus because today is the day that he got up from the grave. Come on, somebody, right? And this God just keeps filling us up. That's the truth. And my prayer today is that if you came in empty at all today, if you came in empty at all, no matter what that emptiness looks like for you, that as you look up to Jesus today, you're going to find everything that you need. Funny thing about looking up, right? If you guys would have walked in here today and I got up here and the first thing I did was just start looking up, what do the people usually do? They start looking up, right? Did anyone ever played that prank on you where you just, someone's looking up and you're like, what are you looking at? You know, there was a day um, a couple of years ago, six years ago, I guess, August 21st, 2017, where it seemed like the majority of our nation was looking up that day. You remember what it was? Yeah. It's going to happen again next year, April 8th, 2024, right? Only we'll be in the path of totality, so it's going to get like dark during the day, and that's going to be a crazy thing to experience. But I remember this day, August 21st, 2017, because it was the day that I went to uh, seminary, the first day that I started up in St. Louis. And, you know, some people live their whole lives, and they never get to experience uh, one of these things. I remember it was a big deal. Like, kids got out of school early that day, even in Texas, where it had, like, 0% chance of any of the, the, it going dark, right? But kids got out of school, and I just remember how enveloped our nation was by this, right? That there was something bigger out there than us. And I also remember that on Amazon, you guys go to Amazon, did you uh, look at those glasses that you could buy? Remember that? Yeah, it looked like that. <laughs> Anybody, uh, there's YouTube videos as well for like do-it-yourself projects where you can make a cereal box viewer. Anyone do that, show of hands? We had one at the previous service. Anyone take a picture of the person doing that? Because I think that looks pretty funny. 
I'm really curious if it worked, actually. But again, I remember this day so vividly because it was the first day of seminary up in, in St. Louis. And, uh, you know, St. Louis that day actually was in the path of totality. And we were supposed to get like a 25 to 50 percent um, coverage like that day, I guess, where it was supposed to get dark. And so Pastor Marty and myself, Pastor Marty's the, the former pastor here, lead pastor, uh, we flew up to St. Louis early that morning. Uh, we got our luggage, we got to the hotel, we checked in, got some lunch, and then we headed over to the campus, the seminary campus. And I remembered to grab my, my glasses because while we were there, that's when this whole thing was supposed to take place. And, uh, you know, we, we saw it that day, and I got to be honest with you, it was so incredibly, incredibly lame. <laughs> It really was. I mean, I think some cloud coverage that day kind of stopped me from seeing it and all of its glory. But what was really funny is while we were there, and remember, this is my first day on campus, so uh, I'm over there, and I'm starting to put on my glasses, but I glance up, and there's some seminary professors or students, or they're together, and they're up on top of this building, which I'm like, you think 20 feet's going to really change your view of this thing that's happening in the sky, right? But then I was like, Ooh, this is kind of dangerous, right? You're putting on these glasses and they could fall. I, I don't know. It was just kind of weird to see all that. But I remember looking up through my glasses that I bought and just thinking, you know, this was not what I, what I was expecting, right? And so I talked to some of my friends who got in the next day uh, who were in my class and their churches were like in the 100% zone where it actually went dark that day. And they said, oh my gosh, did you see it? It was amazing. I was like, what are you talking about, man? Totally lame, He's like, I, you didn't see what I saw? It's like, no. I just think that brief story right there, that illustration, it shows us how there can be two different people looking up at the same thing from two different angles, and they're getting something so different out of it, right? I believe that's what's happening all across the church uh, today as we all look up to Jesus and we see what he's done. But you know, there's so many people out there who don't know Jesus, who don't know what he's done for us. And so as they look today, they may think it's foolish, right? But there is so much evidence to support the fact that Jesus is no longer in the tomb. Number one, his body isn't there. There's no bones in the grave, amen? That's awesome. And you know, some of you, it's the same Jesus you've heard over and over throughout your life, right? For some of us in the room, Jesus, he makes up our entire life existence, and knowing him, it changes us to our core. For others of us in the room, it's more about, it's just a convenient stop today on the way to Easter brunch, right? And I, I get it, Easter brunch is awesome, I'm not knocking that, I support it full-heartedly. But this is not just some story. This is not just some day. This is not just some God that we're worshiping today. Did you hear the songs that we just sang? Did you hear the lyrics in them? We have a God that is welcoming, that turns graves into gardens, that his resurrection means your resurrection as well, that you have resurrection power in your blood because of what the Holy Spirit has done. He's brought you to faith, and that changes everything. So today I, I pray that you hear less of my message, you hear more of Christ working in me and through me today, that you hear God's word. Uh, but I'd like to just pray for a moment that we, that we would receive that today. If you bow your heads with me. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come in here, that you would move mightily in this place right now, because I know some of us come into this room empty and exhausted, and we're not sure why, God. And God, you are the answer that fills us up. And so I pray that through something that is said, through something that has already been sung, through the kindness and the joy that maybe they saw on a volunteer today, that your spirit would just move once again, because it's all about you. Everything that you have done for us, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Our Easter resurrection text uh, comes from the Gospel of Mark 16. And the first verse, it says this. It says, when the Sabbath was over, that day of rest, right? Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James. Anyone else get so confused about all the different Marys in the Bible? I have a mom named Mary, so you just add that on top of it, right? It gets confusing sometimes. But it says these two Marys and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. They were going to anoint his body and do a kind thing to a man who has been so kind to them. Because remember, Jesus died, and dead people are supposed to stay What? dead, right? So you anoint them for burial, for burial, for permanent burial. And it says, as they were going to do this very early on the first day of the week, meaning Sunday, scholars believe between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other a question. 
We find that in Mark 16:3. It says, who's going to roll away the stone uh, from the entrance of the tomb? And that's a really valid question, okay? One maybe you've never thought of, but they say, who's going to roll away this humongous stone that's in, in front of the tomb? You see, that stone was sealing the tomb shut, and commentators, they, they disagree on the weight of it, but like low end, we're talking like a stone that was 250, 300 pounds, high end, like 3,000 pounds, right? So these are not just a bunch of Marys who have been through CrossFit before. You're right. They are having to do this on their own strength, okay? But these women, they want to do something kind for Jesus. They want to do something for their master, for their teacher, and for their friend. But there's an obstacle that's preventing them from doing this good thing. And I believe that when we're asking each other these kind of same questions, as, as these ladies were asking each other, and sometimes all we ever do is all, we just look around, right? We never look up. And they probably were filled with worry and anxiety because they had no answer to that question. How are we going to move the stone away so we can do this kind thing for this man that we love? You know, some of us, we come into this room this morning, we've got obstacles in our life, and we're asking each other the same questions. And it's fine to ask each other questions. God encourages that kind of fellowship. But if we never point each other back to our Creator, if we never tell each other, look up and see what God has done, we too will only be filled with worry and anxiety and unhappiness. And sometimes that leads, uh, leads us to even being hopeless. But it was something that these ladies did that I think is so awesome for us today. In verse 4, it says, but when they looked, what? Up. How cool is that? When they looked up, what did they see? The stone, which was very large, has been rolled away. See, I wonder how many obstacles we face in this life that if we would just look up, that obstacle would no longer be in front of us. We would just bring it to God, right? Mark 16, 4 again says that it was very large, and that stone was rolled away, and someone brought it to my attention uh, this week, that, that the Gospel of John, it says that when they looked up, it was removed, that the stone was removed. So was it rolled away or was it removed? I don't know, <laughs> right? Maybe both, right? Maybe it rolled away and then it rolled so far away that it just got removed. But I like the fact that sometimes obstacles, when we look up, right, we can see God working in our life to help us remove that obstacle, and I like other times we look up and we see an obstacle and then we look to God and it's no longer there. That there was a miracle that happened. I kid you not, just this month in our congregation, in our church, there was a person who was diagnosed with cancer for like the second or third time. It looked really bad. They came back to me one day and they just screamed in my office because the cancer was gone. Just miraculously. God, he still works miracles in this life. And yes, it is his will that be done. But we have a very powerful God. That's what the power of God can do. But the number one thing that the power of God does for each and every one of us is it gives us everlasting life with him. See, at the tomb, these women saw a miracle, that God got to the tomb before they did, and he took care of what they couldn't do. And there are things in your life that are too strong for you on your own and too overwhelming for you on your own. And when all we ever do is look down or, or to the world or just around us, it'll always be there. You know, one of my favorite psalms in all the Bible is Psalm 121, uh, verse 1, where it says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Say this with me. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. My help today comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who has gone to that cross and who's defeated the grave. But you see, the psalms, they're, they're the prayers of the Old Testament people, right? And these are things that the people of God would have had memorized in their hearts, in their, in their brains. And as the psalmist is writing this, you can imagine them lifting their eyes from, from the struggles of this world, lifting them up to the hills and the mountains. And they see a God that's created everything. That reminds them how powerful this God is. And then naturally, they, they go just a little bit higher than the hills and the mountains, and they see what? They see the heavens. They see God there as well, again, reminding them that he has the power and the authority to do anything. It's pretty incredible, because if you actually looked up, you would see that God has strength and power to help you in this life. Verse 5 and 6 of Mark 16, it says, As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. That is what this weekend is all about. That is what today is all about. The Jesus who died on a cross for your sin and my sin, for all sin, 
He legit died. He was buried. He was sealed in a tomb, a tomb that was not supposed to be, to be opened at all. If you did, you would have been killed for it. And then on Sunday, somehow, Jesus, he gets up out of the tomb because he's God. The stone is rolled away. It's removed, and he comes back to tell us that all of our sin has been paid for, that the debt against you is canceled for all time. And now he's offering to us not just eternal life, that one day we'll see him in all of his glory. But in every day, you can walk with him in this life, that he'll bring you fulfillment no matter what, that he will give you purpose in this life. You see, the greatest gift you've ever been given comes this day to you, a resurrected king and savior. You see, God, he's proven his love for you. And no one can ever tell you otherwise. You see it at the cross and you see it in the empty tomb. My question for you today, though, is do you want it? You got to answer that for yourself. Do you want it, right? And I want to challenge you to think about that. What does this Easter resurrection story mean for you? Because again, for some of us, it changes us to our core. And I can want something for all of you that maybe you don't want for yourself. You can want something for me that maybe I don't want for myself. So you have to really analyze what does this story mean for you? I believe that through Jesus, he is the answer to all of our problems in this world. And again, I don't know how you came in, but I'm really good at uh, reading statistics and looking up things on the internet. <laughs> and I can tell you that statistically, like overwhelmingly, there's a collective emptiness that's going on in our nation right now and in our world. The general social survey, which is like the gold standard, if you will, has been polling Americans over the last 50 years on happiness levels. And over the course of the last year and the last three, really, with the pandemic, it's cratered a lot. We have more people saying now that they're, they're more unhappy, right, than very happy. Unhappiness levels are at all-time highs, and it's only rising in our younger generation. We see that as we interact on social media, right? And even with one another socially, together we are divisive. We're argumentative. There's this unhappiness that's involved in this world for whatever reason. But not only this, burnout is at all-time levels. Did you know that? Maybe you feel that today. You see, the McKinsey Global Institute has done a study, and they've shown that 42% of women are burnt out. 35% of men are burnt out. And I want to remind you that burnout is not like a weak term. That's a very strong term. It's not like, let me go home, take a nap, and then everything's going to be okay. No, it's like I'm exhausted. I'm overwhelmed. I'm not sure how much longer I can go at it like this. These numbers are crazy. Cigna, the global health leader, says that 61% of Americans are feeling loneliness despite living in a world that has more ways to connect than ever, and yet we're feeling more disconnected. Again, collectively and overwhelmingly, there's an objective emptiness that we're feeling. People are exhausted. People are angry. People are unhappy. People are lonely. People are arguing. People are divisive. It doesn't feel right to me. Does it feel right to you? All this going on while statistically, again, in our nation, we're far ahead of many other nations, right, in many categories. And we have things like houses, and we have things like food and clothing and entertainment, cars, all these things accessible to us at our fingertips. I don't know what more clear clues and hints that we need collectively to show us that the things of this world are never going to fill us up like Jesus can. Only Jesus can fill what is needed most. And the reason I know that, because I go back to Psalm 139 that says that he is your creator. <laughs> He's the one that knit you together in your mother's womb. He is the one that knows your every need. He's the one that gives you this eternal life. Until you get that, this life will not make sense. You'll be reading books about how to find your purpose all the way until you die. And there are plenty of books out there about that. And it's for a reason, right? This world was never meant to fill you up the way that Jesus can fill you up. But it takes time being in his word and seeing what he's done for you. This Easter message today in one line is this. The tomb is empty so that you and I would never have to be. God left the tomb empty so that you and I would never have to be. We don't have to be empty. 
We don't have to, to be argumentative. We have this promise for eternity, right? We don't have to be exhausted. You don't have to be lonely. You don't have to be unhappy. You don't have to be rude. You don't have to be any of these things because of what God has done for you this day. So look up. Get what you need from your Lord and your Savior. Look up and see the cross where your Savior died for you. Look up and see that the, the, the stone to the tomb has been rolled away. Look up and see that God Almighty in Jesus Christ is reigning over all things this day. Look up with me and look for the resurrection and look for uh, Christ to come back to make all things new once again, where there'll be no more pain, no more tears, no more sorrow. Doesn't that sound like an amazing, everlasting life? I want you to listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 6. He says, for if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will live also with him. For know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has any mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, the, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You know, if there's a, as a pastor, if there's ever a day that tells me that it's not about me, it's this day. The story preaches itself, right? You know, you think after 2,000 years that a story of a man dying and rising would kind of lose its luster, right? It kind of died down a little bit. It makes you think that there's something to it, huh? There are those who are, who are celebrating today, right? And there's those who are thinking that we're celebrating some dead guy. I, I, I get that. But we got more than that. We got more than a cross. We have the empty tomb. All we have to do is look up. Critics say, oh, but we got Muhammad. His words right here say if we play our cards right, if we flip the switch at the right time, we get paradise with 72 virgins. All you, gotta, all you have is a prophet who died on a cross. You know what I say to that? We got more than just a cross, right? We have the empty tomb. All we got to do is look up. And then there's those who say, oh, we got it figured out how through reincarnation you can move from being a zucchini to a tomato, the best tomato that you can be to finally becoming a human. And then you can start meditating. You can achieve nirvana. And what do you got? You have a silly cross. Oh, we got more than that. We have more than an empty cross. Say it with me. We have the empty tomb. All we have to do is look up. Critics who say, but it's all in science of the mind. Says so right here in the greatest science fiction author of all time. That's what we got. What do you got a cross? No, we got more than a cross, right? We have the empty tomb. All we got to do is look up. But we got a book right here written by an angel from heaven, guaranteeing you your own planet, right? A wife of your choice, people who weren't as good, of you, good as you, uh, waiting on you hand and foot for all eternity. All you got to do is go on a mission trip and a little community service. What do you got to do? You know what we say to that? We don't got to do nothing, right? Jesus has done it all, Amen. And that's what faith is all about. He died on a cross to forgive me. He, he rose from that grave to give me eternal life. And how do I know that? Because we have more than an, an empty cross. We have the empty tomb. All we got to do is look up. A death without a resurrection is pointless. A resurrection without a death is meaningless. But an empty cross and an empty tomb together, it means victory. Victory for you. Victory for... Uh, Jesus over sin and death and the devil, victory for the disciples who were weeping, victory for the Marys at the tomb, and that's why, though they were all crying tears of sorrow over the death on that cross of a son and a brother and a teacher and a friend, those tears changed from sorrow to joy, and we have reason to rejoice today and forever. Why? Because they finally knew that they had more than just an empty cross. They had the empty tomb. All they had to do is look up. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.